The Tim Hill Podcasts. Ordinary people's extraordinary stories. Welcome to the Tim Hill Podcasts. In this episode, I'm going to have a chat with Marlena. She's going to tell us all about her life. So Marlena, if you can tell me when and where you were born, and if you can describe what it was like, where you grew up, the sort of schools you went to, and the education you received. Absolutely. First of all, Tim, thank you for having me on your podcast. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to start by saying that my parents in the 1940s, before I was born, were medical pioneers in Paraguay, South America. They happened to be in the U.S. the year I was born in 1951. But when I was three months old, the youngest of five children, they took us all to Paraguay to found a leprosy hospital in the wilds of Paraguay, South America. So that's where I grew up. Um, it's a German Mennonite community in the middle of Paraguay, which adds to the sort of the, the uniqueness of, sort of the, the, the environment that I grew up in. Um, so I went to school in a one room little schoolhouse in German on the leprosy station. So I, I thought just leprosy was in like the Indian subcontinent. I didn't realize uh, that they had it in South America as well. Yeah. At the time in the early 1950s, there was actually the thought that there were between six and 10,000 leprosy patients in Paraguay alone. Um, and and, and the, the, the problem, I think the estimate was reduced after that, but the thought was that there were up to 10,000 of them when he went. And the thing about leprosy in those days is that, number one, they were called lepers. Um, yeah. <laughs> rather, rather than, right, and with all the biblical overtones of what that yeah. means. That's, they that's were, treat, treat, treat people like a leper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So they were incarcerated. They were basically incarcerated. They were treated like animals. Yeah. Um, and we can speak about a bit later uh, what my parents did to revolutionize the treatment of leprosy. But in terms of my childhood, we were in this isolated area of Paraguay in a little low German Mennonite community. So my parents grew up in German community in Kansas. And there were German Mennonites in Paraguay who then helped them found the leprosy hospital. So it's a little tight knit Mennonite community. I didn't even learn to speak Spanish until I, till later when I went to high school in Spanish. So it was a German school. And so I was a little barefoot kid on a leprosy station. Uh, didn't really know what was going on in the world outside of our little community. Then, so, that, that, so it was a German school. Did you speak German? Yes, my mother tongue is actually Low German, which is Plotitsch. Very few people know about it. Um, it's a dialect that's completely different than High German. Um, mm. So I spoke that when I was very young. And then when I started school, the school was in High German. Right. I mean, I, I, I spent quite a bit of time in Germany uh, in my military career. And uh, obviously, I can. I'm fairly fluent in German myself. You know, I can order some beer and I can order some food. Yeah, I can do Deutsch. Zwei Bier bitte mit Pommes und Mayonnaise. Yeah, yeah. All the important phrases, you know. All the important phrases. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but then oh, when yeah. I was 10, we no longer had teachers for the higher grade levels on the leprosy station. So then my parents sent me to Asuncion, which is the capital city of Paraguay. And I was basically on my own, um, left to fend for myself. Now, a bit of background also is that... Um, my relationship with my father has been very, very important in my life. My early relationship was very tumultuous. He was a hero doctor in my mind. He was also a brutal 
disciplinarian who beat me until I was bloody. And so we had this love hate relationship going on. And I was a pretty unhealthy kid living without supervision in this big capital city of Paraguay. And when you put together a young, uh, not very sophisticated kid who is not supervised and who has a big hole in her heart because of um, needing to, to heal a wound that she doesn't even recognize she has, bad things happen. Mm. And bad things did happen yeah. to me. I uh, Basically, at the end of uh, my time in Asuncion, my father disowned me. Uh, my Mennonite church banned me from participating in church activities. And I took my sinful self and I escaped from there. But what we all know, and I'm sure your listeners know, is that we really can never escape from ourselves. And so then a, another chapter started. And I don't know if you want me to continue there, but it was uh, truly not the escape I thought it would be. Hmm. So just looking back at, so you're in the capital of Paraguay. What was the school like? I mean, you, you said that you, you didn't learn to speak Spanish until you, you got to, yeah. to the secondary school. So how much of a steep learning curve did you have when you arrived? Um, very steep. <laughs> what I did was uh, basically memorize much of what I had to learn because I didn't speak Spanish. And I had to start with uh, jumping into high school without knowing the language. Um, and so it, 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 it was a lot of work, but here's the thing, at that time, I felt that I could succeed in school and therefore be loved. And that that whole craving of being, mm of belonging and being loved, I poured that all into my studies and believed that if my teachers were proud of me, I would therefore feel loved and feel like I belonged. And so I, it was a passion for me to do well in school. And I did, I eventually uh, graduated at the top of the class and I did very well. That did not heal the wound. No, it, it so didn't. I guess this was like the early mid sixties. This is now, yes. And so when I escaped to the United States, it was 1969. Uh, imagine a naive missionary kid who's trying to escape from herself arriving in the United States in the late 60s. I didn't even know what drugs meant. <laughs> uh, the culture that I came into was completely unknown to me and very foreign. Mm. So whereabouts in the States did you arrive? Where, my, where did you aim for? Well, I didn't have a choice in that matter because my parents were paying for my trip north. And so they got to say where I was going to go. And they sent me to the middle of Kansas in the midst of their Mennonite relatives. Um, <clears throat> And so that's where I landed, mm. in central Kansas. Did you bump into Dorothy while you were there? <laughs> well, that is what people think of in Kansas. I was going to say, if your listeners don't know about Kansas, it is a, a barren, dry, Dust cold bowl. as heck in the winter, hot as heck in the summer place. Um, and the Mennonite community around me, I rebelled. I was, I was a rebellious kid still as I mm. went to the States. And so I was, now I got to rebel against relatives in Kansas. You know, it doesn't, if we're rebellious, it doesn't matter where we are or whom we're connecting with. We're going to, I rebelled against. Yeah. So, so from your perspective then, how, how much time did you sort of put up with it? How much time did they put up with you? Because <laughs> I, I, I guess that their their discipline is quite strict with their upbringing and stuff. It so, is uh, quite strict. No, I bailed out of there within months. 
And I uh, married someone who understood what it was like to be a missionary kid in the United States. He had grown up in India. We had two children. I divorced him. Then I married a, a very abusive man for a few short years, and then I divorced him. Um, I stumbled from one disaster to another. And after that second divorce, I finally, I really hit rock bottom. And in my memoir, I talk about healing from my brokenness. And people have asked me, what, what does it mean to you to be broken? And for me, looking back, it was a point of not even having anger anymore. And the anger had propelled me my whole life until the age of 36 after my second divorce and I'm on the floor, a heap on the floor, and there's not even anger. And there's finally the recognition that that situation out there or those people out there are not responsible for what's going on in here. And it was really the brokenness that allowed me to layer back all of those layers of my ego that had been lashing out in anger during my, the first 35 years of my life and begin to recognize that I needed to deal with what's in here. Mm. Um, and it was about that same time that my father, who was this willful, stubborn doctor who always got his way no matter what, mm. also began to experience blows to his ego. And as I describe in my memoir, it was really at the intersection of that brokenness on both our parts that allowed healing to happen. And so the, the really the story in my memoir is a story of reconciliation. It's a story of forgiveness. It's uh, a story of, of uh, healing. Mm. Let's just take you back a little bit. Um, so you arrived at, uh, and you rebelled against the <laughs> the, the, uh, the Mennonites there. How did you actually escape? Because, I mean, it's, it's, I guess their community is fairly well locked in and um, they don't take kindly to people um, running off. Uh, I, married someone. That, what, I, married, what, I married someone and ran off. All right. One of them or, or an outsider? Okay, so I want to clarify something for you and for our listeners. Often... Uh, Mennonites are considered the same as the Amish. Uh, the Amish are even more closed as a community than Mennonites are. So I was not part of an Amish community. Um, my parents valued education, for instance. Um, thank God. Um, yeah. yeah. And so let us not confuse the Amish and the Mennonites. So yes, the Mennonites are very, very strict. Um, and, and they did throw me out of the church in terms of participating in church activities, but it's not the same as the, the Amish sort of excommunication. It was right. not that extreme. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think because I guess that, from from outsiders looking in, the the two are fairly similar uh, in the way that they they live and work together. Yes. So so the guy that you married then he was uh, he was Amish as well then. He, uh, he no he, again not Amish not Amish, uh, not Amish right right Mennonite. Um, <laughs> yeah, he was at this Mennonite. Okay. Yeah, he, he was he was there at this Mennonite college that I attended very briefly uh, before we got out of there. Um, but no, he was uh, he was from Presbyterian background. But anyway, he was a, he was a way to escape. Again, attempt to escape. But I want to emphasize yeah. that all of my attempts at escaping really did me no good. Mm. So where did you go? Uh, back to Paraguay. Oh, right. And you might ask, why would I do that? I took my new husband to Paraguay and we built a house for my parents who had then moved to East Paraguay away from the leprosy work. And they were building a new community in East Paraguay and offering medical services and they needed a house built. 
So we decided to build a house for them. Um, it, it is hard for me sometimes in retrospect to even understand my own motives, mm. but it's that same love hate relationship with my father that both had me fear his anger because at the time we still had a tumultuous relationship, but also mm. admire, almost adore him because of the heroic work that he and my mother were doing in Paraguay. Yeah. So how long did that last? How long did it take you to build the house? Uh, we were there for a year and a half, came mm. back to the United States, um, and we were married for 10 years. Uh, at that time, I put him through school and I took a few classes here and there. Um, and I finally finished my undergraduate work um, after we had our second child. We then divorced and I stumbled on. Yeah. So what happened to the children? Um, they, did they stay with you or? They, yes, they stayed with me and they spent uh, a lot of time with their father in the summers and during holidays. Um, they're grown with their own children and they're doing well. Good. So, so you learned a few lessons then. <laughs> I'm bringing uh, up. I learned quite a few lessons, yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. So you got divorced then. So what did you do for work? What was your degree in? So my undergraduate degree was in French and Spanish. Uh, I've always had a love of languages. It was in, instilled in me from very young age, uh, having grown up with German, then gone to school in Spanish. And then I learned French as a uh, college student. I went into a graduate degree in French. My intention was to become a professor of French. I loved everything about France and about the French language. Uh, but when my children's father and I divorced, I realized that I would need to support those kids. He was an opera singer, uh, not a lot of money in opera in those days, unless you're on the big stage, which he wasn't. Um, so I went over to what is often referred to by those in the liberal arts, like the French department. I went over to the dark side oh. and, I, and I, I went for an MBA, a master's in business administration. I then continued on. Um, it was difficult because I was a single parent with raising two children, but I continued on and got a PhD in uh, strategic management. And so, it, again, education was where I poured my energy and where I excelled. And so I became a very successful business professor and consultant. Eventually, I was uh, elected as a fellow in the Academy of Management, which is an international academy um, of about 20,000 members and an elite fraction of us were are recognized for extraordinary contributions. So academically and professionally, my life really um, blossomed yes. while all the yeah. while, yeah. yes, while all the while my inner struggle continued mm -hmm. until I hit that rock bottom, until I could find reconciliation, first of all, with myself, and second, with the figure in my life who was the, the major force that I contended mm. with. Yeah. <clears throat> so how did, how did you go about that reconciliation with your father, I guess? Sometimes people say to me after reading my memoir, how can this be a story of forgiveness? You and your father never said, I'm sorry. And I firmly believe, based on my experience, that sometimes forgiveness happens organically. When we, when we experience our own vulnerability and our own brokenness, there's an, there's an opening to see that vulnerability in others. Mm. And forgiveness 
can happen without the I'm sorry. There was a moment in 1988 which I will never forget. And it, it, was, it was a moment that validated what had been left unspoken, the reconciliation and the forgiveness that had happened gradually, but had never been spoken. And it was a, my parents uh, had just celebrated their 45th wedding anniversary. And this is now in Kansas. They had come back to visit in Kansas and they were celebrating 45th wedding, wedding anniversary. And I was their MC. And after the celebration, we're sitting in their home and my siblings are all around. There's a lot going on. There is a lot of commotion. And my father and I are sitting next to one another on their old dumpy, squeaky sofa. <laughs> and I reach over and put my hand on his. And I said in our native low German, du hast nuscht. Fashion ans. And what that means translated to English is there's nothing bad between us. And from then on, for the next 25 years until the last goodbye, every time we said goodbye to each other, the last words we said were always Do as nosh fashion ans. And that became the title of my memoir, Nothing Bad. Oh. Yeah. I did wonder. <laughs> yeah, about the title. Yeah. Mm. So <clears throat> you're going to this understanding with your father. And um, so after that, what? where did he go? Did he go back to Paraguay? Did they, did they spend a whole life in Paraguay? They did. Um, so my father went there initially in 1941, when he was still single, they had a courtship by mail. She was a shy young nurse in training in Kansas where he had come from. Um, they wrote letters to each other and it took three months for a letter to get from Kansas to where he was in the backwoods of Paraguay. And he was, what he was doing is he was a pioneering doctor for a group of immigrant Mennonites who had come over from Russia during World War II. And one of the interesting parts of the story that my, my husband and co-author Ed O'Connor and I wrote our second book called About My Parents. And one of the things we write about in that book is the Nazi fervor among these pacifist Mennonite immigrants mm in the Chaco of West Paraguay, they were, they were hoping that Hitler would win and they could go back to Germany and to their farms in Russia and get out of the hellhole they were in in Paraguay. It was a mm -hmm. desert that was really, it was considered nearly uninhabitable until they came. There were nomad uh, indigenous tribes that lived there. But until those Mennonite immigrants came, there were, there were very few, quote, white people there. Yeah. And so my father was a pioneering doctor there. And then they, uh, they eventually, as I said, through mail, uh, were engaged. He came back to Kansas, married his, his young Mennonite nurse, Clara, and off they went the day after their wedding back to the Chaco of Paraguay. And they spent the rest of, most of the rest of their lives in Paraguay. And our book called is an expansive saga of those 60 years that they were pioneering medical uh, missionaries, uh, pioneering in various areas of Paraguay. So mm. they founded hospitals in the Western part of Paraguay, they founded the leprosy hospital in central Paraguay. And then in their later years, they founded another hospital in East Paraguay that was serving again, a community that had no medical services. Hmm. So who funded them? Was it, was it the, the Mennonite community that, that funded their exploits? That's a really great question, Tim. Uh, they had, Two main sponsors, the American Leprosy Mission, once their leprosy work began, 
and also the Mennonite Central Committee, which is the, the umbrella of Mennonite relief and peace and justice work around the world. Hmm. The thing about that, though, and what makes this such an interesting question is, especially during those middle years when they founded and ran the leprosy work, my father refused to lock up people with leprosy. So this was a really pioneering, revolutionizing work that they did in that they refused to lock people up. They said, we want to keep them in their homes with their families. He used to say to us kids when we were little, don't ever call them lepers. They are people with dignity like you and I mm. who have a, an illness called leprosy. So anyway, the, in, in this revolutionary place of, no, we're not going to form a colony here to lock them up. We're going to go out in the wilds of Paraguay. And he went out on horseback for days, slept under the stars, mm. looking for patients who were hiding because they were so afraid of being locked up. And so he, had, he was on fire to change how we treat leprosy. The American Leprosy Mission and the Mennonite Central Committee said, this man is crazy and we are going to withhold funding, which they did. For over a year, John and Clara Schmidt, my parents, sent letters back to the States, to their, to their friends, to their churches, to their families and said, help us keep this work going. And they raised the money themselves to kind of hobble along. Mm. And eventually, the, both MCC and most importantly, the American Leprosy Mission uh, came around. And they have publicly said that John and Clara Schmidt are pioneers of revolutionizing how leprosy is treated on the planet today. But it was quite a journey. Mm. Sounds it. And what was your part in, in helping this out? Because obviously you, you had to come along by this stage. You'd, you'd rebelled, you got married. Um, bring, bring us a bit further forward. Once, once you had this reconciliation with your father, how did you, or, or what did you do? Did you continue to, to sort of go down to Paraguay, occasionally help him out or or what, what was your role okay. in, in um, their mission? Yeah, so I would say that for a decade or so after our reconciliation, I was very, very occupied with raising my kids, with getting my degree, with starting my professional life. Um, I certainly did visit them and sent money for their work occasionally, um, mm -hmm. but I was not fully invested in their work. It was really not until I retired five years ago from a fabulous career in business administration that I stumbled onto, number one, um, my mother handing me Step boxes and boxes of letters and diaries and journals and books that they wrote themselves about their work that others wrote about them and said, would you write our story? And at the time, I actually, when she asked that, I had not yet retired. And I thought, there's no way, that's not the kind of writing I do. Mm -hmm. But I took her boxes. And then once I retired, Ed and I sifted through this material and we felt compelled to bring this story to the world. It is a story not only of great service and extraordinary contribution, but more importantly, and this gets to the, really the title of your podcast, these were ordinary people, very flawed, ordinary people. Mm. And their contributions were remarkable. Um, and so we felt called to put this, we have over 700 separate sources of written documentation of their lives. 
And we felt compelled to put this together into a story that is really a story of love, of adventure, of intrigue, of political revolutions. But deep down underneath, it's a story of deep service, of people passionate to serve those in need. And you know what? Our world today, I think, is longing for those kinds of stories. I say this in response to your question, what have I done to support their work? And I would say far too little, but the writing that we're doing now is in support of their work in the sense that we are bringing it to the world. Are they still around? They are not, no. That, that's a shame because this is a platform that could that they could tell their story. Oh, could they ever? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let me let me just take you back a little bit. So your work career then, you you've you've got your degrees and everything like that in business management or yes administration. Yes. How did you get into that work? What what inspired you to become um, an administrator? Well, number one, I was not an administrator. Um, I have a PhD in business strategy, uh, which means that I was teaching people to become administrators. Um, I also did a lot of consulting, primarily in the healthcare sector, uh, helping people uh, find niches in the industry where they could thrive. Mm. And so I did not myself become an administrator. The answer to your question, though, is quite simple. I needed to make money. I needed to support two children on my own. And so my passion, which was French, would not have allowed me to support them the way I wanted to. And so that's what took me over to the business side. Right. Okay. So, so you actually, were you teaching in a, a university environment or a college? Yes, I taught for years at New York University in New York City. Um, and then I taught uh, for decades at the University of Colorado. All right. Yeah. And uh, is that where you finished your career? Yes, I, I retired from the University of Colorado about five years ago. And since then have begun not only writing books, but started a YouTube channel. Um, and I know that you have a lovely YouTube channel that you started, I believe in 2018. So you know what it takes. Um, yeah, and, I'm and still working on it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's yeah. a work in progress for me. <laughs> it continues to be a work in progress. So yeah, we, every, every day is a school day. <laughs> Yeah, we have, a, we have episodes that go up once a week. Uh, the YouTube uh, channel is Becoming Who We Truly Are. And if there is a theme that runs through all of our work, the books, the podcast, because we also have three seasons of a podcast, Becoming Who We Truly Are, and blogging, it's a, it's a theme underlying all of that work for us to mm -hmm. all do what we need to do to become who we are supposed to be. And our third book, which we're working on now, it may have the title Healing Our Wounds One Layer at a Time, although that's a running title at the moment. Mm. But it looks at the inner life of the tragic hero that was my father, Dr. John Schmidt. He was a bullheaded man who did great things and he never except for a few brief moments was able to look at his own inner demons and so it's a book that looks at the inner life yeah of a hero a tragic hero hmm. and it's again becoming who we truly are and what do we need to do each of us to become yeah. who we truly are it'd be interesting to see what caused his in the demons in the first place we so are we are, we are we can see where yours came from uh, from from your early upbringing of um <laughs> i guess I, you, nowadays it'd be child abuse well yes yes hmm. 
It would, uh, but in those days, uh, not so much. Yeah. Yeah. No. I mean, time times have changed. I mean, that's when right. I, when I was a lad, I can remember getting caught going scrumping, and a cop were bringing me own body here, and uh, the first thing the old man done took his belt off and gave me a levering. Yep. Yep. <laughs> so, so, yep. Yeah, I mean, but I mean, nowadays times have changed. Times have changed. Yeah, yes. things have moved on, and 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 that sort of thing is is frowned upon nowadays. Absolutely. Perhaps, perhaps we should bring a little bit of it back, just to instill a little <laughs> bit of discipline in some of the kids that need it. <laughs> uh, we have we have three grandchildren, and um, seeing how they're being raised, uh, it's it's quite different. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Perhaps they need one of these. Exactly. Perhaps one of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Occasionally. Yes. But not all the time. So what was your greatest achievement while you was you I mean your your children, let's have a look at your children. You're a single parent, you're you're struggling at bringing them up. Um how how did that affect them and how are they nowadays given your background did you do anything different to the way that you brought up your own children well as you say um a lot of what we do as parents is dictated by the times and the mores mm -hmm. at the time so i did not hit my children uh, by the time I became a parent, I think we were more conscious of the damage we could do if we physically hit our children. So I, that is certainly something I did differently than my parents. I, I was very focused on my career. And so I'm sure that that had a detrimental effect. On the other hand, my, uh, my love for them and my attention to them was, it, it was like a North star for me. Um, mm -hmm. And so they received my, the best parenting that I could have given them, even with my focus on my career. Uh, but there are limitations to single parenting. And, and, and I think if, if my daughter and son were here talking to you, they would say, yeah, there were some upsides to having two sets of parents. Uh, but there were also downsides. Um, yeah. broken, broken families create pain. There, there are probably benefits, but there's pain. Yeah, I don't think there's many benefits, actually. <laughs> yeah, well, I, as, as, as children, they would say, well, they get two Christmases and they get two, two yeah. birthday celebrations. And, <laughs> but those are minor. There is pain, and, and some yeah. of that is borne by our children of broken families, no doubt. Yeah. Yeah. Coming from a broken home myself, um, I can appreciate it. Yeah, you would. Hmm. So, how can people get in touch with you? Ah, right. So the uh, these are some important questions. How can <laughs> they get your book? How can they get in touch with you? Yes. So all of the information about our books, our blogs, our YouTube channel, our podcast are on the website, Marlena feel.com so that's m-a-r-l-e-n-a-f-i-o-l.com the book called that i've spoken about our second book um, has its own website and that is called a saga.com so it's c-a-l-l-e-d-a-s-a-g-a.com and the books are available. We know that in the UK, um, both the memoir and the, um, the book called are available on Amazon in the UK. Not sure about yeah. other bookstores in the UK. And are they available on Audible? Yes, uh, yes, absolutely, both of them. Who did you get to read it? Ah, so yes. Um, the book for the, the narrative narrator of called is Jack Warren. And I have to tell you, Tim, this was such a great experience. Um, 
he narrated the book and then we had to review it, you know, to, 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 to approve yeah. it and, and maybe edit a few places. So I'm listening to a book that we have written. We wrote the words and I'm listening to Jack Warren narrate the voice of John Schmidt. And I burst into tears. Well, he, he, he is phenomenal. And the power he brought to that narration, it's, it, it's amazing. It was a wonderful experience. So yeah, thank you for asking about that. Jack Warren. Well, is yeah. And what about um, your book, your memoirs? The memoir, and you know, I cannot remember her name. Uh, it's been some years ago, but she also, the publisher I had, uh, Mango Publishing published the memoir and they did all of the search for the narrator. I had nothing to do with that one. Mm -hmm. And I found out afterward, number one, she's a great narrator. She does my voice better than my voice. <laughs> uh, and, and she is, if not the first, one of the first female pilots of transatlantic um, Air, air, airplanes. So oh, she's right. a captain. She's one of the first female captains of a transatlantic um, airplane, which I just found absolutely wonderful as my narrator. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what can I say? This has been inspiring. It's been fascinating. Well, what, it's a, been... what a story. I mean, it, there's tragedy in there as well, but um, from, from that tragedy to where you are today, we we published works and and uh, able to to sit and talk about your story is phenomenal. It's been a privilege to speak with you, Tim. Truly. No, thank you so much for coming on the show. All right, thank you. The Tim Hill Podcasts: Ordinary People's Extraordinary Stories. 